Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Health Tech Beat podcast. The mission of our podcast is to show the real life challenges of implementing and working with the technology in healthcare. And the podcast is sponsored by Demigas, a company that develops IT solutions for healthcare startups and companies. And you can check more on the website demigas.com. Uh, my name is Ivan Dunsky, your host as always. And I am joined today by an honored guest, Ram Friaga. Ram is the outgoing CTO of Impulse Mobile, a company he helped found and build into a 250 person organization. In 2013, Impulse had a handful of clients. And now they are an industry leader, engaging over 100 million members. They closed three acquisitions and recently closed a large private equity investment. In his role, Ram has led the engineering, product, and compliance teams, working with local and offshore teams. And he's proud of the positive impact in company technology uh, is having on millions of lives. Uh, Ram, thank you for joining. How are you today? I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. And yeah, looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, could you please tell us about Impulse? And it seems that you achieved significant results, and I'm curious to learn more about the company and its featured products. Yeah, obviously that's something I'm very excited about. It's been a, an amazing journey for us when we started this a while back. I think some of the main features, if you will, of the organization is really just one that our technology serves both in the platform space, you know, how can clients build things on top of our platform as well as building solutions. So we took a, a step towards that and more recently have, um, have gone into more of the solution space. What I mean by that is, you know, our platform is primarily allowing clients to do health engagement. How do you reach members uh, about their appointments, reminding them to get their screenings, reminding them to go for exercise, check their weight, whatever the engagement may be that our clients want to use our platform to outreach about. We will supported that over time. We understood that based on some of the criteria, based on some of the requirements of really true positive engagement, where you're not just sending a message and hoping that you listen and read the message, you change behavior. And so we really evolved our interactive capabilities using NLP to say, Hey, what are people saying in response? When I tell them to go get the flu shot, are they saying that? You know, they, they're concerned of the cost or they're concerned about how far the flu shot clinic is or the things like that, that may be coming back. And then that interactivity then said, okay, now that we understand, especially with chronic diseases and care situations that require not just an individual or a, a single outreach, but more of a longer term education, possibly behavior change. We started building a tailoring, we built a, a tailoring engine that took not just the NLP results, what did people say, which we responded to in real time, but also said, okay, what's their profile moving? How are they, what behaviors are they engaging in? What are they not doing? And then what's the next best content? So we built a, a recommendation engine for the content as well. So those are the three sort of pillars, you know, the delivery mechanism, the platform, if you will, to get the word out, the NLP, the engagement engine that says, Hey, let me talk to you in real time so that you can use human uh, natural language. And then finally, I wouldn't say the newest been around for a little while, but the layer that's, uh, that I think is most innovative is the recommendation uh, engine based on past behavior and, and trying to, to get to that. We've also, as you mentioned, three acquisitions. One of them is, you know, investing in an IVR platform. So we have a very robust, we started out just being SMS email, very focused on mobile, but recognizing, especially Medicare populations. Landlines are, are significant and, and continue to be a group of a population that we have to reach. And sometimes landlines are the best way. And so IVR allowed us not just with landlines, but also mobile, of course, but to engage in interactive voice. So that's something we threw, you know, we, we added to the mix through that acquisition. And then most recently we had a, a learning platform, which had a, an abundance of really good content based on learning theory and really trying to, to educate the member by virtue of using expert videos, experts in the field and various health topics and breaking it down into very basic terms for people like us who are not, you know, of the medical profession to understand and hopefully educate ourselves and, and be more health literate. So that was done in 
early 21. If I'm not mistaken, time's flying, <laughs> losing track. And then it was late 2020 and then officially 21 that we acquired the company called The Big Now. And then in late 21 and closed in early 2022, we acquired a company called DevCloud, which was, um, to, was actually a competitive ours. And we really were quite respectful of, of what they did. And they were, they were making some, some good progress and, you know, excited to have them join. They too have sort of similar ideas around orchestration, focus very heavily on the Medicaid and government programs in general, Medicaid space, which is a very important area, I think, uh, especially as it pertains to, to making that impact, that mission that I was, you know, that you mentioned. So we're very excited to, to have them join the team. And so they're based out in San Mateo, the, the big nose in Minneapolis. So we've now not just become company based in Los Angeles, but really a company that's now truly across the country with engineering teams and, and professionals across. And as you mentioned, we do work with uh, organizations throughout the, the world. Now we started with Delhi and India, and now we have actually a team that's uh, based primarily out of Belarus, but also in Ukraine. And a lot of those folks have moved out because of the recent situation and there, but working with them, we've, we have worked a little bit with an organization in, in Uruguay briefly, but those are the main, the growth of the organization. It's yeah, it's quite a lot. It's been quite a story. Yeah. I'm curious to learn more about the product specifically, like you mentioned uh, recommendation and, and look at. So I'm wondering, it's obvious that to, to build that, you need to have much data and like what helped you to. Maybe you can elaborate on distribution channels. What provided you an access to like many patients and how did you build your product in a way that the patients really used you? So I, I think that is a key because all these recommendations and all these things, they happen next after you yeah. have oh, yeah. traction. So yeah, absolutely. No, you're, that's a great point. I mean, I think that you need to convince people to use your products, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you don't want to convince them with very kind of exotic things, you know, simple stuff. And that's really what we focused on. And that's what I meant. Platform, right? It was basic. There wasn't any, there was no magic. There was no AI per se. People, the clients knew we were working with large enterprise clients. As a small company, you had to deliver what they needed immediately. You didn't want to tell them what they could use a year from now. It was, Hey, you have a problem today. We can solve it. So it was very tactical, but our vision along the way was, Hey, let's get them in. They need a problem solved today. Once we can solve that problem, then we can start exposing them to some of, you know, the roadmap that we have. So you started with enterprises. You, Just, you, oh yeah, we're a B2B organization, uh -huh. you know, consumers don't pay for it. Mm -hmm. So the Kaiser Permanente is humanist. They, they are the, the paying clients. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with their members, their patients, but the, the member doesn't know whether it's impulse. They only know whether it's Kaiser Permanente. The branding is all through our clients branding. So we are behind the scenes from, from a client perspective, oh, yeah. we're the engine behind it. We're, we're mm -hmm. literally behind the scenes, which I think has been good. The other thing from a business model standpoint is they're the ones that control the money in the U S market, right? Consumers have to go through their insurance, getting individual members to start paying outside of what they're already doing. I think that that puts an undue burden. So working with the Medicaid plans, working with the insurance, commercial employer plans. That has been our strategy all along. Our investment came from VCs that understood that market. We took a very healthcare focused route throughout. How do we work with the system and understand it? Our CEO came from Humana and led a large, a very large business unit within. I was the CEO of that organization. Our CFO came from healthcare as well. And, you know, from the finance side. So understanding both, how do you run a business within the population health? within a large insurance plan? How do you run the finances? What are the things that a CFO of, a, of such an organization would ask? Uh, what are the questions that would, that would want answered? And so I came in actually not from healthcare. I was wanting to get into healthcare. I came in purely as a tech guy, wanting to apply my skills to healthcare, but that leadership with, with Brian and Chris was, was, I think a big part of our success of just knowing how our clients think and, and what makes them, you know, more successful, helped us to say, here's the product that you need. So I think it's really about, and we've heard this a million times, so it's nothing 
profound, but it is important that it plays out really well, which is listen to your clients. Don't try and, you know, don't try and force them into something they're not ready for. You, once you get their trust and their respect and you do provide value, then you can start innovating with them. Then you can start growing with them, building, but to shove down innovation in someone, especially in healthcare, which is very risk averse, there's a lot at stake. And if you go too fast, I think you run the risk of losing your audience and losing their trust. And I think our very measured and, and systematic approach allowed us to get that data that you're talking about to then create more of the data-driven products. And some of the other things that we do, did in some cases, especially in the recommendation engine, is really uh, make it more of an expert system rather than a, a probabilistic system. And the reason being clients can see, hey, why'd you say that? Why'd you send that message? Well, here's, here are the rules that got triggered. Do you agree with those rules? Yes, I do. Okay, so there you go. Now you agree with those decisions. If you don't agree with the rules or we don't agree with the outcome, let's work out the rules and we can use data, you know, to inform how to you know, improve those rules. So those are handcrafted, right? So we are very particular to make sure that there's clear visibility for our clients to say that nothing that we did is sort of this black box magic that to us was not the, the, the best way to convince our clients to use these, you know, higher end products. And of course, you know, we charge them more for it as well. So, you know, all the more reason to, to make sure that they are completely on board. Uh -huh. Got it. And uh, could you tell us like, because part of our audience is the healthcare and healthcare startups, and they just want to know and, and learn how they can apply their technology in real life and in the real world. So what was the process of acquiring this like payers and how you introduce technology to them? Because I think that at that point, you didn't have like much data and patience. Like what was the journey, how you did convince to use the technology? Yeah. So, so everything starts with, with a little bit of luck, right? So, so we, we were fortunate to get Kaiser Permanente, which was one of the most innovative and well-respected organizations to mm -hmm. sort of do a pilot with us in the early, early stage. And that was incredibly successful. We dropped the no-show rate quite significantly. And, and that sort of opened the door a little bit. We took that and, and again, what was the problem we saw, right? So you have a specific problem here. People are canceling without telling you. People are not literally not showing up. And so for a com an organization like Kaiser, that is very, very optimized for making sure that their doctor's time is spent, you know, as well as possible. Mm -hmm. One cancellation is quite costly. So the ROI was very important. And that's where I saying, you know, from a financial perspective, you can't just say, oh, we're going to make all those big, amazing decisions, difference in, in members' lives and, and they're going to take care of the health. Well, you got to play that back in terms of dollars and cents. You, you, you got to speak that language as well. Insurance companies, as you know, payers particularly are, they're the risk managers, right? They don't want to, they want to, they were to manage the risk and they're in large part driven by numbers. So I think that absolutely is a significant part of the story. Here's how many dollars we can save by virtue of, you know, you know, if you reach a hundred people, let's say 10% of them engage in that behavior today and then 20 tomorrow, that that's that 10% difference or that the extra 20 people will save you or gain you this much if it's new members. Yeah. So I think those dollars make sense. The other thing is, you know, frankly, the timing was perfect with the affordable care act coming into place and mm -hmm. some of the requirements around, especially government programs requiring come organizations to really look out, not just, Hey, did you reduce your costs and in investment back into to patient populations on the provider side, reducing readmission rates and, and some of that accountability that came in really helped organizations like us that were saying, you need to engage with your members. You need to get them, you know, doing the things that you, you talk about and you put you know, marketing brochures about, but are they doing them? And so we provided this incredible source of feedback. Even something simple like a uh, health outcome survey, Hossman, right? You don't want to get surprised and say, oh, I guess I didn't do well. <laughs> you know, you want to get ahead of that. And so things like that to engage members in this interactive, low cost, ubiquitous manner, SMS being a core mm -hmm. channel, we convinced a lot of our clients to say, hey, look, it, it's, it's low cost to start with. The, the value could be tremendous. And we see, saw that time again. We were able to publish a couple of papers initially around our results, around Medicare 
refills and showed that using these channels, you know, we could drive some significant outcomes. And so those, you know, it's never one thing, right? It, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't any magic bullet, but I think the other core to this is continuous agility. Just don't lock mm -hmm. into one thing and say, that's going to be it, you know, make or break. If you approach it that way, my sense is that I'm not suggesting that people aren't successful that way, but we took a little bit more of an inclusive approach, a larger tent of things that we engaged in with our clients and in that sense, really supported them in more than one way. And we made the technology secondary to the value that we were providing, right? If the value could be derived with less tech, we would be the first ones to suggest it. There was no reason to position something that was more complicated, more expensive if there wasn't the resulting value. So I think you know, trying to be as transparent and as clear, like we're after the outcomes, so are you. Let's use the best technology available. I think for a technologist, that's a, like I said, my colleagues on the leadership side, they were very focused on the value, right? So for me, sometimes I'd be very proud of our tech and wanted to put that first. <laughs> that was the only thing I cared about. But I think ultimately the, the real answer is, hey, what are you doing for your clients and your members? And technology is one of those tools. It's not the only tool. And I think that's a very important consideration. It is a very powerful tool and it will ultimately be the only tool that you'll rely on, but it's a combination of understanding, listening, learning the market, healthcare expertise that we had with the people that we hired, huge. So I, I think I've answered your question in a very yeah. broad way, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you get the idea that it, it yeah. takes a lot. So. Yeah. Thank you. Let's talk about the present. Could you please share with us what is your current primary focus? In your work? Yeah. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm, you know, I switched into an executive advisor role recently. I get the, you know, benefit of, of picking a project that I really care about. And one of those is around data. You mentioned data. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, when we are, when we're engaging with over a hundred million people, you can imagine that that does generate a lot of data and it's always been my understanding and what I read, but, and again, nothing too groundbreaking here that, you know, healthcare data um, has a tremendous amount of value if done right. And so my focus right now is what are, how are we presenting data in more meaningful ways, immediate, actionable. I think uh, a lot of our clients are just inundated. I mean, they're collecting data all the time as well, but they are, you know, we frequently get into conversations with them where basic reporting becomes a challenge and you wonder why, you know, you've got the the best technologies and, mm -hmm. you know, the technology is advanced, whether you, you, you want to use good old, you know, relational databases to, to all the way to, to, to more exotic things. And yet they're struggling. And the answer is that it comes so fast and often the, the value that you're driving becomes primary to the collateral product, which is the data, right? And what I believe is, and this is the focus that I want to, you know, that I'm working on with our data team is to say, Hey, how can we first handle the problem of just providing access to our data for our clients, you know, or working with us on that they can get value about their own members, um, insights they can use that may have nothing to do with using our platform. In some ways it may have to do with how they engage separately and you know, outside of our systems, but that's okay. But, but we are collecting a wealth of information. So things like our social terms of health. How do we take that and give that back to our clients in a way that's more actionable? I think the operative word is we keep collecting data. There are lots of reports you can download, you can get beautiful graphs. And in fact, our current dashboards looks like a collection of dashboards. It's just wealth. And, and at the end of it, it's like, what do I do? How, what am I supposed to get out of this? So my hope is that, you know, with this effort, we'll be able to sort of simplify that presentation and make it a little bit more accessible and more actionable for our clients and also our internal teams as well. So that, that's a big project that I'm interested in and focus on right now. Mm -hmm. Cool. And could you please share with us, what is the main challenge in technology development? That, that could, it could be a very long conversation, but I mean, you know, look, uh, we as an organization, have, like I said, evolved, right? We didn't just have this grand idea 
day one and then, you know, build it as we wanted and release it to the world. We evolved, we learned, we adapted. And that adaptation, sort of, you see that in biological systems as well. There's some stuff, there's legacy there, there's mm -hmm. you know, redundancy, there's some deprecated systems, if you will, that are just lingering around causing you trouble. And so there is that challenge. How do you build? How do you innovate? How do you, you know, build with modern technology while you still have to grapple with what's already there? Mm -hmm. Those APIs, right? We built APIs that looked like what our clients needed at that time. Maybe they weren't the best of breed in, in current terms. They served the needs, our clients got it. They were able to interact with us. You know, they got the data in, they got the data from us. But now we look at them and say, wow, that's not well built or maybe the architecture is not scalable. But we can't just swap it out because our clients are saying, wait, I've built, and as we know in healthcare, uh, once you put something in place, it's very hard to sort of unseat it. Good thing for us, right? Reason stickiness once you, once you get into a client. However, I think both sides of the, you know, our clients recognize that there's a better way of doing things, but the resources on both ends are required to make those changes. And so our challenge is sometimes how do you convince them to make that investment on their end and our end. Mm -hmm. uh, so changing to modern technologies, even if we know what the answer is. It isn't as simple as just building it. It is a little bit more of that budget and other things that have nothing to do with code. All right. What is the think, business value, right? So yes. Why not? I mean, it's working. Just leave it. It's yeah, it, yeah but it's not going to scale. And, and, and so all of these conversations are, it, it, the clients are, are smart and, and they recognize it, but they are also, you know, they have similar constraints, you know, budgets are, are not just unlimited. So that's one. The other is, I think there is a certain, and you know this because you're, I think you're intimately aware of the resources, talent. And, and so when we as an organization go through something like the great resignation, the impact of our size is significant. When you lose, let's say, you know, five engineers who were doing very critical things, that knowledge and well, crucial in your architect. Yes. And you suffer through that. You replace them. Yes. But then the new person is now stuck with trying to figure out what to do next, but also what has happened and what those decisions are. So, so a lot of our time is spent, you know, as I'm saying, these aren't code problems necessarily. These are about processes, management, the marketplace. But as we were talking earlier, you know, it's, it's, if you can get some of these things, right, if you can motivate the team, if you can keep them excited about what they're doing. Those, you know, we had a lot of folks who, who may have left and now come back and have come back. You know, we call it the boomerangs in our, our org because there are so many of them. And the ultimate goal here is, you know, from a retention standpoint is to say, hey, look, this, you're making a huge difference. We compensate you for that, but also you need to want to do this. This is something that makes you happy and, and, and you know, fulfills your need to, to good, to do good things. Nevertheless, the market is incredibly aggressive and competitive. It's hard to, to argue with some of the organizations that we're not directly competing with from a marketplace perspective, but from a talent, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's another technology related. Our engineering teams are always, you know, sort of paranoid, <laughs> our, our engineering leaders, like, okay, you know, who's on the, you know, who do we need to, to make sure it's engaged and happy. So I think that's. That's a big part of our, our part of it. And, and just, you know, innovation and in, in an industry that is risk averse, how far do you go? How much are you willing to, to get ahead? Those are always difficult challenges. We invested in some technologies thinking, Hey, it's around the corner. Give us six months. It's going to hit the market hard. Again, things outside of our control, you know, it's been two years and you're still not seeing it. I'm like, okay, so should we have invested in that? Could we have afforded? To, to have done that, given the resource constraints that we have, should we have invested in something else a little bit more tactical? So those are, I think those questions will continue to ask any good organization. I think will always ask itself how much innovation is the right amount, too little, you're, you know, you're going to get washed out too much. You're going to waste money. You're going to, you know, you're going to have too much out there that you are frustrated that isn't getting sold. And before you know it technologies being sold for the sake of, you know, being sold versus putting the value first. So I think, you know, we want to strike that balance. And so the, I, I, I'd say, you know, talent, 
some of the legacy and, and just striking the balance of how much innovation, how much risk do we want to take in terms of the future? Those sort of things that are interesting challenges and, and probably never ending. Yeah. Thank you for such a structured answer sure. for, for, to a complex uh, <laughs> with yeah. Sure. And you already mentioned that about challenges you have with talents. And could you please tell us uh, how you deal with the challenge? I assume that with that growth, you have shortage of engineers and like how you overcome it and like what is maybe your strategy and what is your proposition to candidates? Yeah, I know this sounds a little arrogant, but, but we are an industry that is actually doing good, right? So yeah, healthcare is by, you know, by all accounts about to make positive differences in people's lives, right? Especially some of the programs mm -hmm. and the clients that we have, we're incredibly proud of that work. And so that's something we put up front. You want to, you know, if you're a purpose driven, you want to do good in the world, come talk to us, right? If you're just purely after making money or trying to just, you know, push your career without any, you know, it could have been in anything, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the impact or negative impact it has on people, maybe you're not the best fit for us. So I think that we, is something we've, we've mm -hmm. had really clear talent that could have gotten jobs in other organizations that we wouldn't call them evil, but you know, clearly have a, have a different perspective on, 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 you know, what they do in the world. Yeah. So I think that's important, our mission, our purpose. And then, and then it is, we're still a small company by virtue of joining us, you get to make an impact. And we are a very transparent organization. Small companies doesn't mean that everything is. You know, just because you're small doesn't mean that things are transparent or things are inclusive. We very much pride ourselves in very open. You know, we have weekly meetings where we get on, the CEO comes in, we have different departments present our revenue numbers, our, you know, Good. investment, or we present our board decks to our employees. We have them, you know, included across, you know, middle management and up on, on operations committee meetings. So they know how are our numbers. Part of it is just purely to make sure that the people who are doing the work are in, well informed of what their colleagues are, are dealing with, right? And how they can help each other. So that level of transparency mm -hmm. is something that I think in new employees will really encourage. When we've asked our new employees, like, hey, what have you enjoyed about them? Everyone's so supportive, collaborative. They, they just are very open, you know? Everyone's super busy, but when I get time, they're incredibly supportive. And I think that's something we pride ourselves on, that inclusiveness in our culture supportiveness and so what we do even in the interviewing process like people like me if i'm on the call i step away and say ask the people that are you know on this call that that either report to me or your colleagues and peers and ask them what you you know what what may be of interest to you i said i think that's another important thing and honestly the challenge that we have from a tech perspective if you're you know trying to get engineering talent those are significant we are dealing with high growth we are dealing with very complicated you know, data challenges, for instance. So you can run the gamut of technologies that you're interested in pursuing and learning and not just talking about it in some kind of a theoretical sense, but actually putting them in place. And one of the things that our tech team, if they have a fair amount of freedom to experiment, mm -hmm. if, you know, there is no reason to just do just proof of concept, if you don't think there's, there's some clear purpose. So I think we do proof of concepts with a clear expectation that those will succeed so you can start implementing. So we gear things up in that sense. So we don't waste our energies in running random experiments that, you know, people don't, they don't have that personal investment in. They, they want this to succeed. They put their energy into it because we get behind it. Right. So I think though that ability to take some risks on the, on the technology side and really learn and, and experiment and see that come into production, not just in some, you know, sort of theoretical thing. Like I said, I mentioned one where we built something way in advance and people got excited about it. That, that was a big bit of a lesson for us. Like, Hey, what was our analysis? Where was it wrong that we, we sort of got it off by, by two years. We're there, but two years is a long time in our lifespan. So that that's, I think, you know, the other opportunity that we give our, our engineers, you just, you get in there, you get to, to actually play with technology in production and you know, see it out there, not, not just in some theoretical experimental environment. So I think th those are things that are very attractive to good talent. Growth opportunity is as absolutely huge. And because we're a small organization, 
you can show that you can show that there's always new roles and we're right. always expanding. And Hey, if you, if you want to go the management track, you can do that. If you want to go more on the technical you know, campus, we mm -hmm. started building roles specifically to that. We found one individual actually who joined us really sharp guy. And, and he thought, you know, to, to get ahead in his career, he had to be a manager. So he went into that and he didn't enjoy it and he wasn't really good at it, but he was an amazing engineer. So it's like, Hey, do you want to, so we built a role around switch back. Know, switch back to an individual contributor role, but you know, we knew his, his contributions were quite significant. He built some of the core technology. And so we created this, you know, principal engineer or, or staff engineer mm -hmm. kind of model, again, borrowing from other organizations. So doing things like showing that you're not pigeonholed, you know, that the only growth isn't to play politics. The growth is to do good work. If there is no role, we'll create it. We'll create it. We'll figure it out. And I think as we grow, we are getting better at processes being very clear about what the growth opportunities are. So those are things that I think, you know, internally as we're building our teams within the organization that we're using. The other is our partners, you know, outside, and we know that we won't be experts in our Postgres. So, so we, we hired, you know, the experts in Postgres who commit code to, to Postgres or RabbitMQ or so we bring in airflow, we hired astronomers. So we are very keen at that level to say, we don't have to become the experts. We need to know who the experts are. And we've invested in these kinds of very specialized expert consultants that we can bring in as needed, put them on retainers, again, budgets being carefully managed. And so when we need, when we have issues or when we're making a new architectural change, we bring them in and say, Hey, look at this, you know, fresh perspectives objectively, what's the best way of doing this? So we've gained a lot from that. And then third. And, and this is actually, you know, in no particular order, I think these are all equal for our partners out, you know, outside the org, right. Our development partners, we look at them, not as just DAFOG or, or just, sorry, just folks that are cheap. Uh, they're in fact, in many cases, not cheap, you know, they're as <laughs> that's not what you, you use, but a couple of things that do make it, you know, from a, from a cost perspective, we can ramp up and ramp down. So when we need to invest, let's say in client implementations, we get a, a lot more clients at a given time. And sometimes there are cycles, right? We, we budgets on the client side may dictate when we close deals. And so mm -hmm. all we're stuck doing a bunch of implementations all of a sudden, and our team's not going to keep up. We can then ramp up with our development partners at the same time, if things go down, we can then very easily flex. So that's a huge advantage for us. The other is to really engage with them. Organizations that are outside us see things different. They are exposed to other problems that we aren't exposed to. That knowledge and that expertise is something that we've come to rely on. And, you know, there's, I, I, I don't think it's about taking what, you know, let's say that organization did for another client, but it's more around the kind of the thinking, the challenge and the questions, Hey, have we thought about these kinds of things? a little bit more, and they, these are risks that you may have not considered, that can become incredibly valuable, but you have to treat them as partners. You have to treat them as your equals and, and they are equally talented and competent, just maybe living a few thousand miles away and, you know, in a different time zone. So we have found when we hire people internally, that they respect that relationship that we've built, that they value it, and then they can, you know, harness it to everyone's benefit. So I'd say that's sort of how we do that. We, you know, we, look, we're, we're under-resourced. We'll always will be, I think. One of the things I'm very proud of, and I know some organizations play it differently. I, I can't speak to whether that's a right or wrong. I like how we did it, which is we, when we hired someone, we went, we hired them to keep them. And if they didn't perform, sure, they would be asked to leave. And if they left for their own reasons, of course, we, we try to keep them and retention mm -hmm. is a big part of our strategy, but we've never had a layoff because of budgets. We've never said, oh, we've overhired and oops, we can't afford to pay people. What do we do? We were very careful. We felt like these were people's lives that we were investing in. And that was a commitment that we were making to each other. And especially as a small organization, there's a tendency when you get an investment to just go spend. We always looked not just the next day, but several days out. And I think I give credit to our CFO. I was an RCO 
you know, to be very protective of people's sense of you know, what they've signed up for. Right? Sure. They, yeah. The security. And, and then like, this isn't just a job. This is you know, a, a commitment that they're making and we have to reciprocate that commitment to them. Of course, if they don't hold up their bargain, I mean, you know, work's got to get done. And if they're not doing it, then sure, we, we unfortunately had to do that, but never because of good people having to be let go for financial reasons. That is something we as an organization never had to do. And I think, you know, something's very proud of. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you work with partners. So I'm curious to learn more about your strategy, how you engage and how you choose tasks. You mentioned that they are like, have, all of them have like specific speciality. Do you offer them to do some kind of part of a product or some product, or is this like specifically to do some job or a task associated with the skill yeah. that the other has? A little bit of both, but primarily I would say the, the, it depends on, so we have different partners in one situation, the partner that we have knows a lot about the product has, has you know, has built mm -hmm. the chunks of the product. And so it has, has a little bit of expertise. So in that situation, we're sort of doling out the tasks equally. Hey, you do this part, I'll do this part. It's much code. We'll do each other's code reviews. So it's, it's really very collaborative. And, and again, it, we're separated by time and, you know, a time zone and, and location, but now with, with zoom calls all the time. That that's less of an, a concern. So that's one model, right? So they're just literally part of the team. They happen to have a different employer who's, who sends them the paycheck, but they're effectively working on the same product team, right? Part of the standups, you know, everything is in other situations, again, based on like, especially this flex model for the implementations team, where we said, Hey, you are working on a specific product or sorry, particular implementation there. We have a project manager possibly coming from us who's doing client uh, mm -hmm. interfacing and then getting the requirements. Hey, get this done. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Great job, you know, and then move on. And so again, the, the benefit of this is that we are locked, you know, we're able to do it on both fronts. In some cases, folks that work on these implementations, they gain knowledge of our product and our APIs and our platform. And so then they say, Hey, do you want to, you know, based on how good they are and, and, and you know, sort of similar models that we use. Um, internally as well, you start out in prod support, let's say, and you want to be a software engineer. Sure. Yeah. If you're able to, to keep up and, and you do a good job and prove yourself, then we'll give you the coding assessment and you can be a software engineer. Uh, so likewise, the same model applies to our, you know, outsourcing partners. They, they can start with implementations team, let's say, and, and if they like working with us and we like working with them and they want to stick around, then they can become part of the product team. And so we you know, have very similar models of growth for them too. So that there is a little bit of loyalty to the impulse team, you know, by, by virtue of that. It's not just a, uh, I just get to do this and I don't like it. And, you know, we have had one said, I want to go into product management. I've used part of the QA team, grown through the ranks. Now he's, he's a product manager. It's like, great. You can help us on that side too. So I think again, we, we do have that sort of sense of partnership with them. They're part of what we, you know, they're part of our team, right? Ultimately that's how you have to look at them. And so when we have concerns, so we, I called up the CEO of, of the organization say, look, we're, we're hammered with a lot of requests. We can't keep up and our teams can't, we can't hire fast enough. Can you help? So they literally pull from other projects that were maybe in a little bit of, you know, downtime said, yeah, let's help you out and then scale up. Mm -hmm. and I said, look, I don't, I don't know if it's going to last more than three months. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, we got you. And so that's when you have that kind of partnership, you can sort of flex and you do it very transparently. It's not a black box. You, you know, mm -hmm. they talk to us, they, they congratulate on our successes and, and the same on their end, you know? So I think that that's a, therefore we can use all these different models of engagement, right? It's not just one. One approach. Yeah, I, I think that th this type of relations bring uh, satisfaction both to development partners and, and, and yourself. Ideas coming in and like there is a feedback, a positive feedback yeah. that is essential. Could you please tell um, us how do you measure your engineering team's productivity? Uh, meaning 
at both in-house teams and partners teams. What is your approach to do that? We do that. Yeah, no, no, we do. We do. But, but I, I will say, so, um, when we were starting out and, you know, just, just getting the feature out anywhere close to the deadline was a win. That's how you measure. We got that feature out or we were able to successfully deliver, um, something and, and, and always, you know, it was, we always were, let's say we, we wanted it yesterday, you know, right. <laughs> there was never something that we could sort of think ahead. And so playing catch up, huge roadmap always feeling like we're behind. So it was just getting a sense that we were able to deliver without burning each, each other out. I, I think that was our measure of success. It sounds very vague and broad. We did start looking at number of tickets, ticket points, and per sprint, we have an ops committee meeting that actually looks at bugs to features. So we go into our JIRA, we export, you know, how many bugs did we deliver to how many features in that month? How many tickets do we have? How many blockers do we have? How many support tickets do we have? So we try and track all of these things and, and looked at it. And, you know, we also track our server flow agreements and whether we're meeting them and our availability you know, uptime. So we measure a lot of things, partly because we're in the healthcare space, but also just to, to kind of inform ourselves, how are we doing? However, that said, and those are good numbers, I think, to give you a rough order of magnitude, like, oh man, tough. You know, a lot of support tickets this one. That feature didn't work out so well or right. broad stroke. We're actually going through a very sort of rigorous sort of metrics design exercise and saying, what are the true metrics? What are the true KPIs that we want to go against? For mm -hmm. example, when we were doing the point system, it's dependent on engineers putting in, you know, valid points, right? And sometimes it feels very bureaucratic. I'm like, why am I doing that? That's stupid. I can fix the bug in the time it took me to put in that point estimate. You can have conversations all day long. You want the bug fixed, you know, you let it go. We have invested in folks that are helping our, the engineering team and also leaders that, you know, invest a little bit on the process side as well to make sure that this is part of what you do. It's like brushing your teeth, you know, you just do it. Maybe there was like some specific people. Or... It, it goes, it comes and goes, you know, you say, Hey guys, let's put it in and like, they'll do it. And then the next month ah. you know, gone again. It's, it's a little bit of like, oh God, like, yeah, it's, right. oh, it's that time of the month again. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of that. So we want to get it, you know, we wanted to make sure that a, the metrics are incredibly powerful, right? And you didn't just collect data and, and then think that's magical enough. No, you have to have a purpose with it. There's, there's gotta be something that, you know, what's the design. And so I think we want to dig a little bit deeper, which components are causing us most grief? How are we investing in legacy versus new? And what is technical debt costing us? And these are areas that are a little harder to, to tease apart. Everyone gets frustrated by technical debt, no doubt. How big is it? How big is it to the point where we truly stop some innovation and, you know, refactor and fix these things. That's a hard, and if we can truly get those numbers that again, and I don't mean to say this, but, but, but there is a good trust between, you know, non-technical side of the house to, to ours. So we, we go to them and say, Hey, we want to, you know, clean up our tech debt. And, and they'll say, sure, if that's what you think is right. So it's really just an internal engineering exercise. Are we convinced that that is the best use of our time or do we need to put in place, you know, additional features to keep up from a product perspective? So working with product and the engineering side and getting some of those metrics to say, where is the best investment? That's what we're actually engaging in right now. And then tracking ourselves. Even the other ultimate thing is we build. That's great. It gets out there. You know, hopefully bug free. One of the things we get less feedback around is how well is it fitting into the marketplace? How well is it selling? What's the business impact of that particular feature to our clients, to our account teams, to be able to upsell or to our clients to use us more? That feedback is something we'd like to incorporate much more, much more organized right now. It's more anecdotal, right? So we get it. We have our meetings, but we want to sort of put a little bit more data to that and put some numbers against it. So yeah, and it's, it's about maturing and, and being able to say, we did it this way. That's great. When you're a teenager, now you need to go up and be an adult and you know, things uh, get a little bit more rigorous and, and, and more streamlined. So that's the process that we're currently in. So it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I feel like the question could be answered better in a, in a couple months. 
Yeah, well, we can have another one in a couple yeah, of months. Sure. I would love to because, yeah, unfortunately we have uh, not not so much time, but I have uh, a lot of questions. There's no worries. Yeah, I have another one yeah. for you. So probably you've heard about this tweet of Elon Musk that <clears throat> he stated that in his mind, technical managers must be technically excellent. So what is your thoughts about that? A great question. Uh, I've been thinking about that as well. Let, let me also add to, to it yeah. something because to my mind, <clears throat> that is quite contradicting because when you are an excellent coder, maybe you don't have this like communication skills yeah. and maybe you don't have desire to have them. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're a manager without technical skills, you don't necessarily understand all the aspects, and I would put it ROI, right, on, the, yep. on some decisions. So you should have some technical awareness, but on what level? That's a really a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's a bit of the, the organizational size. I think we've gotten to an organizational size where writing code as a CTO, for instance, is just not sustainable. You mm -hmm. can do it maybe once, you know, for a proof of concept or as an experimental idea, but definitely not production code. And in fact, my engineers, you know, refuse And this, this is, you know, it's like a, a known thing. Yes. Refuse to put in my code into anything, you know, that's like, oh, that's great. Thanks for, for showing us great, good idea, Ram. I got this. I think it's about having enough technical, like, I think it's exactly what you said. It's understanding a, if you don't know who you're hiring for, right, you, you're relying on other people to do the work. And it's not machines that build the code, not yet at least. It's humans. So we have to evaluate. And if you don't have enough technical chops, if you haven't been there, done that, are you hiring the right people to then rely on to do the work, right? So I think as a technical manager, you're, one of the primary responsibilities is to, is to hire the right talent, retain that talent. And if you can't mentor them and if you don't have the technical depth to be able to mentor them in a way that's meaningful, I think that is maybe what Elon Musk is referring to. However, I do not believe the technical manager need to get into the code and start committing. I, I think it's about knowing the attributes and characteristics of good versus bad quality versus what would be called, you know, not excellent. That comes with experience that comes with having done it. You can't just read it in a book and say, yep, I think I know what I, I need for my engineers. You must have learned some of that the hard way. You must have made some of those mistakes so you prevent others or it can detect it when you see it. But there comes up, I mentioned, you know, when we had our engineer who I, was a, a, exactly case in point to your point, Ivan, he was a very good engineer. He was not a good manager and, and he, he continues to be a very good engineer, but I believe he's not a good manager <laughs> and he doesn't want to be. And I think there are, and I've seen in, really good managers whose technical skills are, let's say a little stale at this point, right? They've, it's been a little while since they've really, you know, worked it, worked them, but they're very good at picking up talent, investing in talent and, and continue to, to retain that I think makes for a great technical manager. Yeah. How do these people, this good manager, as you think of them, how do they, uh, deal with that problem, evaluating skills and uh, decisions? I, I think it comes down to curiosity. I think they're willing to engage in those conversations, able to have, to empower the team, to have the conversations with them. I, I do worry a little bit about the manager who says, look, you know, I set up the meeting and let me know what happens, right? You know, tell me what the action items are and I'll follow up. Those technical managers I worry a little bit more about. I think those are the ones that Elon Musk is talking about. Those are the, the folks that sort of yeah. feel like their job is truly just management and forget the tech part of it. Give me a report. <laughs> Give me a report. And things are going well. You know, how are you guys doing? Any blockers? Okay, good. Okay. Yes. I mean, there's value in that. Uh, that's good for organizations uh, and especially for the business to hear that things are well, but for, for the team to feel like they're with you, I think being in those meetings, have voicing opinions, even if they're wrong, willing to state some opinions and hopefully educated opinions, let the team beat you up, be humble enough to say, yeah, that was a dumb idea. That I think is how you stay connected and you pay attention to who in the room is willing to risk and do these things. And if you've assigned your leaders, you know, the, the tech leads or whatever, and if they 
are contributing in that way, then I think you understand they're adding value. If they, you know, sort of step aside and not engage and not get committed, not get enthusiastic about where things are headed and shifting that accountability to, to other people, then I think one worries a little bit, you know, so it doesn't mean that they have to talk the loudest. It just means that they have to be engaged and accountable the most. And so I think for a manager, it's like identifying those people that are willing to sort of speak up when I say speak up, take responsibility for some of the decisions. But in order to, for that to happen as a leader, I think it's important to sort of engage in the conversations as, as much as possible as a equal, you have to ensure the team feels confident in saying that, you know, your idea is stupid. I have definitely experienced that more than once. Maybe my ideas were incredibly stupid, but you know, the, the point being when you're in that room in a technical conversation, you're all equal. And, and that allows, I think, for someone like me to evaluate who's engaging in what way, who's deflecting ownership, who's, who's, you know, willing to take some of that ownership and accountability. Those are things that I'm looking for so that I can manage the team a little bit. Yeah. You mean from the engineering team? Yes. Who, who could take the responsibility yeah. from the engineering yeah. team? Yeah. Yeah. So those are things that at my level, I, I need folks that are on the field willing to sort of take charge and push through. There isn't, a, you know, I think a single path to the right solution. There are multiple paths there. So let me ask um, you further. So, so, but if they don't, if they don't take this responsibility, what do you do? Is it kind of marker for you that you need to hire another person or, or replace them or you just, just should like, I don't know, make a conversation with them that I expect you to have that responsibility or what is, yeah. what's going on? I, I think that feedback is important. I, I think, you know, if there's an expectation, let's say they're the tech lead and, and they're mm -hmm. either letting the product manager sort of just tell them what needs to be done and the product manager is essentially becoming the tech lead, which has happened or mm -hmm. can happen, or they defer to folks that would be considered by everyone as too junior to make those kinds of decisions. And also that feedback has to be given to the tech lead saying, look, if you're doing it because you want to empower that junior individual, mm -hmm. are you supporting them enough? And so, it, you know, it's never a, a judgment based on that one interaction. It is a conversation. In one case, I've had a situation where the individual, again, having heard from others, you know, great, good talent, smart, does a great job. I, I spoke to them and. And they basically said, look, I'm more introverted. I don't feel comfortable sort of speaking up in these kinds of group settings. I like to think about things and then come back. And I said, that's great. Then what I need is some form of communication to the rest of the organization or to the, the, to the team that you are taking the lead. So it could be through email or it could be a more a prepared, but, but you need to demonstrate that. And in his case, it was just that he, him being a little shy of showing leadership. Right. And so I think you have to be sensitive to that. I think that's perfectly fine. You don't want everyone to be next to written mm -hmm. talking and talking. Uh, so it's not about just talking, but it's about communicating and communication can happen outside it. And I think that's where the feedback may be. It's like, Hey, if that's issue, if the other is more, I don't get to make any decisions, you know, no one, I, who care, there may be a sense of lack of, you know, empowerment. Hey, is that because you don't think we trust you, you know? I'd like to think that those folks, and genuinely it is true, that they got there because of good work. But yes, there are situations they feel overwhelmed. They genuinely feel like, wow, this is too complicated. I can't keep up with the team. And in those unfortunate situations, we try and find something that, you know, a different path, or in some cases, this isn't the best organization for them. And, you know, that could be a very positive conversation. We are one of many organizations, right? So, uh, and the market's great. So it's not the worst thing to happen. And we've seen others succeed really well elsewhere. So I think it is, it is definitely a follow-up conversation, but I, again, I do less of it now in, in my role because our organization's grown so yeah. much, but that's what we are looking for, for our, our leadership to do. Yeah. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming yeah. to the interview and just to end uh, this, I have uh, kind of more personal questions. 
We call this exercises rapid fire round. I will ask you several questions. What is the latest movie that impressed you the most? Oh gosh, the latest movie. I don't know. I'm blanking on this one. <laughs> I've seen some really good movies uh, late, but one of my favorites, which is a little old, is, is Arrival, but, but I think it's such, a, it's such a long time ago. I've seen other good ones. I just can't think of them right now. <laughs> I'm blanking. <laughs> uh, do you have hobby? Well, I don't know if it's a hobby, but I have a passion, which is soccer. I love uh -huh. to chase a ball and do that. And yeah, that, that's what keeps me out there. Yeah. And what is your favorite book? Hey, it's, it's crazy, but my favorite book, almost my Bible is Eight Chapters Got to the Galaxy uh, by Douglas Adams. And so yeah, it's stupid, crazy, uh, science fiction. So yeah. Yeah. Right. And what advice could you give to your 20 years old self? I think, you know, I just be willing to, to learn, uh, help me open. Uh, always, always be, be humble and, and, you know, you haven't figured it out and you won't figure it out. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the beauty of it. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, you want to get there fast, have to get there before everyone else, those things, they all work out in the end, whether you get there first or second, uh, you know, it's important to, to be there and, and be open to it. Great. I think that's perfect way to end right. uh, this interview. Thank you yeah. for sharing uh, the insights both from the product development standpoint, as well as how the company can evolve from this technical and product perspective. I just enjoyed how we talked about the technical culture and dealing with engineers. So I think that our conversation could be interesting, both for early stage startups, as well as for a company that are growing. Yep. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Ram. No, thank you. Great questions. Before we finish, what is the best way to get in touch with you if somebody wants to? My email address is, is perfectly good. So uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, obviously. So I think those, maybe you can put that out there. So I, I check both quite, although my email sometimes gets a little full <laughs> as, as everyone's, but I do check it and LinkedIn is, is just a great place. Yep. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, listeners, and uh, catch up in the next episodes. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Ivan. Take care. Stay safe.